Um, yes, now for something completely different. Um, I uh, hope that you'll see um, a little bit of overlap with the work you've been doing in the Marin project, but this is mainly uh, a report from the Living North Sea project, which is uh, uh, another interreg project from a different region. Um, I uh, am the project manager for Living North Sea, um, but uh, my day job is uh, director of the, the Rivers Trust, which is uh, an NGO umbrella body for um, catchment or watershed management, uh, which sits underneath the statutory level. Um, and that represents about 40 organisations now in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and we have a sister, sister body uh, working in Scotland which uh, has almost complete coverage of Scotland with a further 25 rivers trusts. Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, the North Sea region because uh, you're funded on the Atlantic area. This is a very, very similar European programme but just takes in the, uh, the east coast of uh, the UK. Um, plus uh, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Germany. Um, and uh, our project is looking particularly uh, under the theme of uh, sustainable management of the environment. Um, and uh, uh, there was a priority for integrated coastal zone management in here. Um, this section, I'm obviously very aware, is about the industry or industry perspectives. And our industry is, is two local authorities municipalities with significant value and responsibility for migratory fisheries, five government research agencies, a university, four local or regional water management authorities, uh, and three NGOs constituted for environment and fisheries, one of whom has statutory responsibility for those fisheries. Um, so I suppose that's, that's our industry. We're, we're, we're people involved in professional management of diagemous fish, that's fish moving between freshwater and marine habitats. Um, and um, of course there's significant overlap with, with um, um, with any structures that are built in those habitats. Uh, there's uh, some of the partners, I'm sure, some of whom you've uh, worked with in the past yourselves. Um, our drivers for this, um, you know, have been things like the EU Water Framework Directive, the EU Eel Regulation, which is uh, providing more protection for that species than any other um, uh, species we deal with. Um, for the Benelux countries, there's an agreement between, of fish migration between those countries because they're into connectivity with, with rivers. Um, various national, local... Um, drivers and, and research drivers too. Um, our target audiences for the project were really policy and decision makers, the engineering sector and communities and we actually involved, had quite a few engineers involved in the project um, who were looking at sort of um, uh, building in of, uh, of retrospective uh, fish passage arrangements um, or uh, building new, uh, new versions of things. Um, and we really want to sort of look at the, the community aspects of, of, of the decisions that people make locally in terms of what they, what they want out of their uh, water ecosystems. Um, two work packages. Um, I'm only going to cover one of them briefly, which is about the, the, the sea trout and looking at knowledge gaps for sea trout. But it does have quite a bit of overlap with your project, actually. Um, and um, uh, quite a lot of focus on the innovative solutions that people have been looking at, two common barriers that we expect in the region. Um, there's been real new focus put on this from, from the EU uh, Commission recently, and this is their latest uh, communication to member states um, about uh, the importance of structures um, and the impact that they're having in terms of meeting other regulations. And they're really calling for, uh, for a move away from environmental impact assessments for this kind of thing to, to more strategic environmental assessments, which we really support, um, which would be looking at... Uh, you know, comparing renewable energy schemes, you know, to really look at, you know, what is the best bang for, for buck, what we can afford to do um, for, for all the sectors. Just a quick look at the scale of the problem here. Um, I've got a few, uh, few maps here, and we're trying to bring all this data together in one place. Um, uh, on the left here is um, a, uh, uh, an analysis of structures in England and Wales, which has been done based on um, head height, uh, so literally just using... Uh, the drop in head to identify structures. On the right is just the prioritized structures from the Netherlands. Um, here is the, the actual um, figures of sluices, dams and weirs and so on in the Netherlands. It really is, a, is, a, in abs is, is vast. Um, here's another visual showing the, uh, um, the east side of um, the United Kingdom specifically where, of course, there is much lower head drop, so they couldn't be identified by, uh, by that uh, remote method. They had to be uh, identified by other, other methods. Um, but we are talking about really massive, uh, massive amounts of uh, structures and um, you know, even in, in countries which you would perhaps perceive as not having big problems, um, you know, Sweden with over 4,000 migration obstacles in streams, um, 
and uh, this is uh, the area that our beneficiary in the project was concentrating on, and all those black dots there are our hydropower dams. Um, so, the, so through our analysis, we found that the most frequent barriers we were looking at were, were tidal barriers, um, run of the river hydropower, um, um, so fluvial hydropower, um, dams and rivers, uh, sorry, dams and weirs and pumping stations. Um, just a quick look at tidal barrages first. Uh, all sorts of different types of uh, barriers around the region, uh, varying from the, the very large, and I don't think I've even got a picture of the largest uh, at Herring Fleet at the, at the bottom of the Rhine. Um, uh, everything from structures involved in shipping um, through to much smaller structures involved in uh, maintaining drainage of agricultural land. Um, and uh, the sorts of options we were looking at were, were possibilities for removal, which I'm not going to touch on much because, you know, it really only uh, features it where we've got possibilities of managed retreat from uh, uh, coastlines. Um, engineering passageways of different kinds and adjusting barrage management was actually uh, probably one of the most productive parts of, of this part of the project. Um, I'm just going to show you a, a slide of various solutions for engineering passageways, everything from natural, new natural channels to, to very complicated siphon systems where where uh, um, dikes can't be, uh, uh, can't have holes through them, um, and uh, um, very simple float-operated devices um, and spring retainers and, and all sorts of sorts of possibilities there. Um, but the real interesting area here was the possibility from just adjusting the management of structures that were already there. Um, this is an aspect of the project that was led on by our Belgian partners um, and some Dutch partners as well, where um, this, for instance, is a historic structure at. Um, uh, in Belgium, which, which can't be removed, it can't be left open, um, uh, but the upstream water bodies are failing EU eel regulation amongst, amongst many other things. Uh, and there's also a, a paranoia about uh, saline water intrusion and the impacts that that might have. Uh, and here we're just looking at um, opening those structures for very short periods of time with the people who manage them. Uh, and um, that's allowed immediate migration of fish through the tidal cycle. Um, and uh, even though this, you know, this was seen as a, a particularly good result, it still only resulted in about 8% of what was required to, to pass through. Um, but uh, the very in, the, you know, the interesting thing about this was that, um, that the impact of saline intrusion was, was absolutely minimal. Uh, in fact, it was on all the sites where this type of um, method was trialled. Um, here's another, another site with a, a similar methodology used. The migration of fish was increased by a factor of 250. Um, large barrage in, barrage in the Netherlands where there is, you know, there is real paranoia about having these structures open at most states of the tide. Uh, and in this case, the agreement with, um, with the people who managed the structure was literally just a 15-minute window uh, in equalization of tides upstream and down where the structure was open to allow um, fish to migrate through. Um, and that's led to this being built into now into the computer system that runs this particular barrage. Uh, and we hope that that's something that will be echoed um, through, the, through the region. Um, uh, and some quite interesting examples as well. This is an example from the UK where, um, as part of the project for, throughout um, the North Sea region, we had um, a fish migration day where we, we worked with different sectors to sort of look at issues. Um, and uh, this particular structure, as normal default position, was, was down. Um, and um, it, for, for a complete tidal cycle, it was left, left open. Um, to look at what the impacts would be upstream. Um, and actually, there, there were no significant um, impacts for the management authority. So the default position for this structure is now open. <laughs> um, and uh, um, it will only be lowered in times of extreme tide or risk. Um, so, uh, um, and this is a, a hydrosonic um, Didson uh, uh, piece of kit, which enables you to allow uh, you to see fish migrating through the structure. So um, a few summaries from tidal barrages is, is that, uh, um, you know, the salinity, pro the main one here really was the salinity problem uh, relating to tidal barrage uh, was not as large as is imagined. And there's certainly quite a lot of opportunities for adjusting the management of, of existing barrages to um, allow fish migration to occur. Um, probably the most controversial aspect of everything we did was, was relating to, to run of the river hydropower. And I, I would echo the sentiments that previous speakers have, have said about uh, that it's the politics that dominate, dominate here rather than the sense. Um, uh, this structure here is uh, at our Swedish partner beneficiaries um, site where uh, um, this structure w was actually removed as part, of the, as part of the project and that removal has just started now. Um, 
uh, Sweden have a particular issue with, with hydropower, as I, I mentioned before, and for that particular town and municipality, they've replaced the uh, energy generated from that one hydropower dam with one wind turbine of a 10 wind turbine array. Uh, so they actually went through this process of made, making a strategic assessment of you know, what they valued, what they wanted, what energy they required, and what was the best way to do it. Uh, and that resulted in the removal of the hydropower. Um, our beneficiaries contributed to this EU issue paper on this, which, which really highlighted the, the, the growth in the uh, sub, sub one megawatt um, micro and mini hydro schemes um, and you know, the relative contribution that those make at the moment um, really highlights that it's the, you know, it's the high head schemes that you know, we want to support where we're dealing with fish migration issues. Um, this is a further, further example of some results that we had within the project of changing screen on, on hydropower intakes to, uh, to stop you know, widespread mortality of, of migrating European eel. Uh, and as some of you who are involved in this issue will know, the European eel stocks have declined by 90% over the last uh, few years. Um, so hence the EU regulation to protect them with quite severe uh, requirements on member states. Um, I'm not even going to go through all the recommendations because, I mean, these are draft at the moment and I don't even agree with them all yet. <laughs> um, as I say, this, this particular area of work has, um, uh, has created the most controversy within, within the project so far. Um, I'm only going to, I'm going to skip through dams and weirs quickly because I don't think that's of particular interest um, uh, to, to this audience, but um, uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, looking at different ways to, um, to mitigate for them, uh, remove them, um, and give confidence to people to actually remove uh, redundant structures. Um, uh, and uh, modeling mechanisms and web GIS, which, which gives people information that they need to, um, to be able to look at the upstream impacts of, of just how much proportion of uh, land area is cut off to, to fish migration. Um, pumping stations, I do think, has a little bit more relevance. Um, and um, that's particularly because the, the, I think the research that's been done on pumping stations and impacts of pumping on, on fish is probably... Uh, a lot longer um, than that's, that's been looked at uh, by, for, for turbines and uh, you know a pump really is in many aspects just a turbine in reverse uh, or the other way around perhaps um, and uh, there is a, a huge amount of, of research done on both the lethal impacts on fish and the non-lethal impacts on fish um, and uh, um, that's been used within the project to look at all sorts of varying types of fish friendly um, pumping systems um, and here are a few examples of, of those that have been designed or tested within the project. Um, uh, I have to say, I think a, a fish-friendly pump is a, a little bit like a pedestrian-friendly bumper on a car. You still don't want to hit it if you can help it. Um, uh, this is a, a, a siphon system where, where the fish pass through the siphon adjacent to the pump. Um, but there's all sorts of uh, technology out there, I think, which uh, um, provides opportunities for... Um, adjusting management at some of these locations. Um, the final aspect that I, I thought uh, would have some interest actually is uh, we, part of some of the beneficiaries were particularly concentrating on looking at um, sea trout, uh, which has particular interest for the North Sea region um, because it, it has a very high economic and social value uh, amongst communities in the, in the North Sea area. There's huge knowledge gaps in their migration and their marine phase. Um, there's a lot of existing infrastructure and resources for carrying out monitoring of, of this species. And it really falls through the net in comparison to more protected species like Atlantic salmon uh, and the European eel. Um, and we thought it would be a good demonstration of what can be achieved by taking a more strategic look at building in migrating fish, is fish, fish issues with sort of development um, in, the, uh, in the marine and transitional areas of the, of the region. Um, and the other thing that's special about the uh, sea trout in the North Sea is it, it does exhibit quite unique characteristics. Um, you saw that picture previously of just how large the sea trout grows in the North Sea. That's, and uh, it, it really sort of behaves much more like the Atlantic salmon, uh, whereas in, in other parts of, of the world, you know, sea trout really only sort of spend a short period at sea uh, and come back, you know, much like a, a large brown trout as opposed to a, a large fish like that. Um, and just going through all the various planning mechanisms that exist in the North Sea at the moment, you know, there is no mention of sea trout eel or any other diagemous fish in those at the moment. So it's a, it's a huge gap that I think people developing in that zone will only come across when infrastructure is either constructed or at very late planning stage. 
And that's something I think we need to, we need to try and avoid with these opportunities that we get through strategic European funded projects like ours. Um, we carried out uh, uh, quite a bit of tagging of, of fish and looking at recaptures of those fish. You know, there really seemed to be a sort of quite cyclo cyclical f migration around the North Sea coastlines. Um, and um, we, we took the opportunity of Trinity House um, uh, carrying out maintenance on navigation buoys in the North Sea to attach acoustic receivers um, to these so that we could, um, we could pick up detections of fish as they, um, as they migrated around the coastline. Um, and um, that sort of uh, partnership provides an awful lot of opportunity for setting up long-term mechanisms for, for all sorts of environmental monitoring. Um, uh, oh, here we go, we've got a bit of animation there. <laughs> so, uh, and this also enabled us to get um, depth profiles of where fish were, were for occupying. Um, and other data has been looking at where they'll be feeding and, and so on. And this provides absolutely, you know, really important information for, for anyone involved in um, um, marine planning. Um, another aspect that really came out of this was the impact of, on river flow on migrating fish. And uh, we were finding within the project uh, quite huge levels of mortality at any um, structures um, in flow in years which have reduced flow. Uh, and this could account for up to 50% of the survival of fish, um, which was previously you know, thought to occur in the marine part of the, their migration, is actually uh, occurring probably at, uh, at migratory barriers in stream, which is um, quite interesting and, and useful information. Uh, and we also took the opportunity to start a quite intensive genetics program, um, which is taking um, samples of fish uh, from their freshwater phase um, so that we can identify their, their home um, their geographic home um, and that's really important for for planning because it means we can take fish from their marine phase and we can actually identify them back to where they came from um, so this is samples that were taken from the northeast coast uh, the northeast drift net fishery and we can see that most of the fish that are being exploited are fish from um, the tweed and and the area that that sort of border area between scotland and northern england um, and this is very important because, as you saw from that map previously, where fish are migrating around the North Sea, we might have planning decisions being taken, for instance, in the Wadden Sea or in the German Bight relating to um, marine renewables or whatever. But actually, the, the population that's being affected by that development is not actually that population. It's a population that might be in another member state. Uh, and, you know, that's both in contravention of, 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 of European law, but it's, um, it's also um, really important to understand these links so that, man so that you can talk to the right managers about how to uh, mitigate for them. Um, and this really just sort of provides uh, uh, an example of all the variety of coastal activities that have uh, been uh, integrated in various marine planning systems for the North Sea. It's a very, very busy bit of uh, marine area. Uh, and, uh, you know, this really shows how complicated it gets when you start adding the migration of diadromous fish on, on top of that too. Uh, and bearing in mind that, you know, other work that's been going on is, you know, is, is possibly shown that the entire European eel population coming out of the, the North Sea countries are probably migrating around the top of, of, of Scotland here in, in some quite confined waters. So there, there are very big, big issues here for multiple member states from decisions being taken in quite localised areas. So, uh, and with that prompt for me to finish, uh, this is my last slide. Um, just to say really that Living North Sea Project's outputs are, are in publication at the moment. Uh, we've just, just finished the project. Um, and, um, y you know, there has been a North Sea expert group on fish migration that uh, combines all sorts of different sectors from, from engineering to the fish biology to tracking uh, to marine to freshwater. Uh, and that's something that we hope to, um, uh, to expand in, in future projects. Um, and I suppose that my lasting or final message would be really, you know, to ask, can we successfully integrate fish migration engineering, ish, sorry, fish migration issues with engineering at the beginning of projects? Because, you know, this has been the sort of fundamental thing that goes throughout, throughout our, our project, really, is that, is that the retrofitting and adjusting things afterwards is much more expensive and much more difficult than actually designing them in from the beginning. Thank you.